please welcome Georgetown University President John J. DeJoya, accompanied by Harvard Professor of Public Policy Robert D. Putnam, American Enterprise Institute President Dr. Arthur Brooks, and moderator E.J. Dion, University Professor at Georgetown University. Well, good morning. It's our privilege to welcome you here to Georgetown for this important and timely event. And I wish to thank all of you for joining us, whether here in Gaston or via webcast, as well as so many distinguished guests here today, including His Eminence, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. We're honored that you all could join us today. We gather today as part of the Catholic Evangelical Summit on Overcoming Poverty co-hosted by Georgetown's Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life and the National Association of Evangelicals. And I wish to thank the NAE and its president, Reverend Leith Anderson, for their partnership and leadership in this dialogue, as well as our own John Carr, who leads the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought. This summit welcomes religious and national leaders who are engaging key questions related to the moral, human, and economic costs of poverty. Our topic could not be more urgent. We have the second highest percentage of children living in poverty among all developed nations. Only five children, one in five children in our nation lives below the poverty line, and here in the district, one in four. All told, more than 45 million people in the United States are living in poverty. The human cost the moral cost of this issue is pervasive and demands our most serious attention. We all have a stake. The Holy Father, Pope Francis, has captured our shared responsibility in these words. The measure of the greatness of a society is found in the way it treats those most in need, those who have nothing apart from their poverty. This is a call for us, a call toward the founding principles of the American idea and toward a renewed commitment to the common good. I'm deeply grateful to everyone for joining with us today. In this room, we have a diverse group of committed leaders from Catholic, evangelical, and civic life who serve and stand with those who are living in poverty here in our city and across the nation. We have the great privilege of welcoming an extraordinary panel to our stage, Robert Putnam, one of our nation's leading social scientists from whom we heard last evening on the moral, political, and policy dimensions of overcoming po poverty in the U.S. His latest book, Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis, examines the growing class gap impacting America's young people. Arthur C. Brooks, the president of the American Enterprise Institute, a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times and author of the upcoming new book, The Conservative Heart, How to Build a Fairer, Happier, and More Prosperous America. E.J. Dion, a Washington Post political columnist, senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution, and a member of our faculty at Georgetown's McCourt School of Public Policy. And we're deeply honored by the presence today of the President of the United States, Barack Obama, who joins us to offer his perspective and experience to not only offer his thoughts, but to engage in dialogue. President Obama has been a lifelong advocate for the poor from his time as a community organizer on the south side of Chicago, where he worked with residents, churches, local government to set up job training programs for the unemployed and after school programs for children to his work now as president where he is working to help communities impacted by our nation's economic crisis, especially those mired in deep and chronic poverty. Through his My Brother's Keeper initiative, President Obama seeks to address persistent opportunity gaps faced by boys and young men of color and to ensure that all young people have the context for becoming their very best selves for reaching their full potential. My Brother's Keeper works with communities, businesses, and foundations to connect young people to mentoring, support networks, and the skills training necessary to secure gainful employment or attend college. In his State of the Union address just a few months ago, he asked us, 
Will we accept an economy where only a few of us do spectacularly well? Or will we commit ourselves to an economy that generates rising incomes and chances for everyone who makes the effort? He called on our nation to, quote, recapture the sense of common purpose that has always propelled America forward. This common purpose is the unifying principle of our gathering here today, and it is now my honor to welcome to the stage the President of the United States, Barack Obama. It's a real honor uh, to be here today with my two presidents, President Obama and President DeJoya. Um, and my friend David Brooks hurled the most vicious insult at me ever once when he said that I was the only person he ever met whose eyes lit up at the words panel discussion. <laughs> and I have to confess that my eyes did light up when I was asked to do this particular panel discussion, and not just for the obvious reason to my left. And it's, again, it's a real honor to be with you, Mr. President, or Arthur or Bob. Uh, poverty is a subject we talk about mainly when tragic events, such as those we witnessed uh, recently in Baltimore, grab our attention. And then we push it aside, we bury it, uh, we say it's not politically shrewd to talk about it. So I salute uh, Georgetown, my friend John Carr and Galen Carey and all the other extraordinary people uh, who are gathered here for the Poverty Summit uh, from all uh, religious traditions all over the country. Our friend Jim Wallace once said that if you cut everything Jesus said about the poor out of the gospel, you have a book full of holes. Uh, and these are evangelicals, Catholics, and others who understand what the scripture said. Just two quick organizing points on our discussion. Um, the first is that when it's time to go, please keep your seat so the president can be uh, escorted out. Uh, the other is that Bob uh, and Arthur and I all agreed that we should direct uh, somewhat more attention to President Obama than to the other members of the panel. I just say that, uh, I say that in advance so that you know this was our call uh, and not some exercise in executive power. This was our, uh, this was our uh, decision to do this. <laughs> Uh, and in any event, we hope this will be a back and forth kind of uh, uh, discussion. Um, you know, Bob and Arthur, feel free to interrupt the president if, it, uh, <laughs> if, you feel, uh, if you feel like it. My first question, Mr. President, is the obvious one. Uh, a friend of mine said yesterday, when do presidents do panels? Uh, and what came to mind is the late uh, Admiral Stockdale, who am I, why am I here? Um, and I'd like to ask you why you decided, this is a very unusual venue for a president uh, to put himself in. And I'd like to ask you, where do you hope this discussion will lead beyond today? And I was struck with something you said in your speech last week. You said politicians talk about poverty and inequality and then gut policies that help alleviate uh, poverty and reverse inequality. Uh, why are you doing this and how do you want us to come out of here? Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, President DeJoya, the Georgetown community, uh, all uh, the groups nonprofits, faith-based groups, and others who are hosting this today, and I want to thank uh, this terrific panel. Uh, I think that we are at a moment, in part because of what's happened in Baltimore and Ferguson and other places, but in, in part because a growing awareness uh, of inequality in our society, where it may be possible not only to refocus attention on the issue of poverty, but also maybe to bridge some of the gaps uh, that have existed and uh, the ideological divides uh, that have prevented us from making progress. And there are a lot of folks here who I have worked with. They disagree with me on some issues, but they have great sincerity when it comes to wanting to deal with uh, helping the least of these. And so this is a, a wonderful occasion for us to uh, to join together. Uh, 
part of the reason I thought this menu would be useful, and I wanted to have a dialogue with Bob and Arthur, is that we have been stuck, I think, for a long time in a debate that creates a couple of straw men. Right? The, uh, the stereotype is that you've got folks on the left who just want to pour more money into social programs and don't care anything about culture or parenting or family structures. And that's you know, one stereotype. And then you've got cold-hearted, free market uh, capitalist types who you know, are reading Ayn Rand and uh, <laughs> you know, think everybody's moochers and that's uh, and, 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 and I think the truth is more complicated. Uh, I think that there are uh, those on the conservative spectrum who deeply care about the least of these, deeply care about the poor, exhibit that through their churches, through community groups, through uh, philanthropic efforts, uh, but are suspicious of what government can do. Uh, and then there are those on the left who I think are in the trenches every day and see how important parenting is and how important family structures are and uh, the, the connective tissue that holds communities together and recognize that that contributes to poverty when those structures fray, but also believe that government and resources can make a difference in creating an environment in which young people can succeed despite great odds. And uh, it, it seems to me that if, coming out of this conversation, we can have a both-and conversation rather than either-or conversation, then we'll be making some progress. Um, and the last point I, I guess I want to make uh, is I also want to emphasize we can do something about these issues. I think it is a mistake for us to suggest that somehow uh, every effort we make has failed and we are powerless to address poverty. That's just not true. For, first of all, just in absolute terms, the poverty rate when you take into account tax and transfer programs has been reduced about 40% since 1967. Now, that does not lessen our concern about communities where poverty remains chronic. It, it, it does suggest, though, that we have been able to lessen poverty when we decide we want to do something about it. In every low-income community around the country, there are programs that work to provide ladders of opportunity to young people. We just haven't figured out how to scale them up. Uh, and so you know, one of the things I'm always concerned about is, is cynicism. My, my chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, we take walks around the South Lawn, uh, usually when the weather's good. Um, and a lot of it is policy talk. Sometimes it's just talk about values. And uh, one of our favorite sayings is, our job is to guard against cynicism, particularly in this town. And I think it's important when it comes to dealing with issues of poverty for us to guard against cynicism and, and not uh, buy the idea that the poor will always be with us and there's nothing we can do. Because there's a lot we can do. The question is, do we have the political will, uh, the, the communal will, to do something about it? Thank you, Mr. President. I feel as a journalist, maybe I'm the one representative of cynicism up here, so I'll try to <laughs> do my job. I want to, um, I want to go through the panel and come back yeah. to you, Mr. President. I want to invite Bob, um, and I'm going to encourage us to reach for solutions. But before we get there, I think it's important to say that your book, Bob, you know, your book, Our Kids, is above all a moral call on the country to think about all the kids in the country who've been left out as our kids in some deep way. Uh, and you make the point that the better off and the poor are now so far apart that the fortunate don't even see uh, the lives of the unlucky and the left behind. You wrote, before I began this research, I was like that. Um, and following on what the president said, 
uh, you insist that the decline in, in social mobility, the, the blocking of the American dream for so many is a purple problem. Um, and I may have some questions later on that, but I really would like you to lay out the red and blue components. Um, and also, how do we break through a, a politics in which food stamp recipients are still somehow cast as privileged or uh, the poor demonized? Uh, but I'd like you to lay out sort of the moral call of your book. Thanks. Uh, thanks, E.J., and thanks to uh, the President and to Arthur for joining me in this conversation. Um, I think in this domain there's good news and bad news, and it's important to begin with the bad news because we have to understand where we are. Uh, the President's absolutely right that the war on poverty did make a real difference, but it made a difference more for poverty among people of my age than it did for poverty among kids. And with respect to kids, I completely agree with the President that we know about some things that would work and things that, that uh, would make a real difference in the lives of, of poor kids, but what the book that you've deferred to, Our Kids, what it presents is a lot of evidence of growing gaps between rich kids and poor kids. That over the last 30 or 40 years, things have gotten better and better for kids coming from well-off homes and worse and worse for kids coming from less well-off homes. And I don't mean Bill Gates and, and some homeless person. I mean people coming from college-educated homes, their kids are doing better and better and keep people coming from high school-educated homes their kids aren't, and, we, and it's not just that there's this class gap, but the class gap on our watch, I don't mean just the president's watch, but I mean on my generation's watch, that gap has grown. And that's, you can see it in measures of family stability, you can see it in measures of the investments that parents are able to make in their kids, the investments of money and the investments of time, you can see it in the quality of schools kids go to, you can see it in the character of the social and community support that kids that kids, rich kids and poor kids, are getting from their communities. Uh, church attendance is a good example of that, actually. Churches are, are an important source of social support for kids outside their own family, but church attendance is down much more rapidly among kids coming from impoverished backgrounds than among kids coming from wealthy backgrounds. And so I think what all of that evidence suggests is that we do face, I think, actually a serious crisis in which increasingly the most important decision that anybody makes is choosing their parents. And if you, if like my grandchildren, I really did a smart, they were the best decision they ever made was to choose college educated parents and great grandparents. Um, <laughs> but out there someplace else, there's another bunch of kids who are just as talented and just as, in principle, just as hardworking, but who, you know, happen to choose parents who weren't very well educated and or weren't high income and those kids fate is being determined by things that they had no control over, and that's fundamentally unfair. It also is, by the way, bad for our economy because when we have this large number of kids growing up in poverty, it's not like that's gonna make things better for my grandchildren, it's gonna make things worse for my grandchildren. So this is, a, in principle, a solution that we, a problem that we ought to find solutions to. And historically, this is a kind of problem that Americans have faced before and have solved, and this is the basis for my optimism. There have been pre previous periods in American history when we've had a great gap between rich and poor, when we've ignored the least of these, in which we've, I'm thinking of the, the Gilded Age at the end of the 19th century, and, and both of you have written about that, that um, period, in which there was a great gap between rich and poor, and kids were, we were ignoring lots of uh, kids, especially lots of immigrant kids, and America seemed to be going to hell in a handbasket, and there was a dominant philosophy, social Darwinism, which said that it's better for everybody if everybody is selfish and the devil take the hindmost. But that, not unlike some of the ideology of, of, of Ayn Rand that you referred to, but that period was quickly, not quickly, but was overcome by a reawakening of the conscience of America across party lines with the important contribution of religious leaders and religious people to the fact that these are all our kids. And now is not the time to rehearse all the lessons of that earlier period, but I think it does actually give me grounds for hope. This is a kind of problem that we could solve as long as we all recognize that it's in everybody's interest to raise up these poor kids and not to leave them in the dust. Thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, by the way, let the record show the president was not looking at Arthur when he referred to cold-hearted uh, capitalists. Yeah. But it is great to have yeah. somebody here from AI. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, EJ, EJ, I mean, when, you, when the president said that, I was just thinking, what was going through my head was, please don't look at me, please don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> but you the, notice when Bob said this about the, you know, the social Darwinism, he pointed at me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I'm more outnumbered than my Thanksgiving table in Seattle, let yeah. me tell you. You just have to look into your heart, Arthur. Um, <laughs> and in fact, that's kind of what I want to ask you to do um, here. I mean, your views on these subjects have actually changed, and I think it's one of the reasons uh, you wanted to join us today back in 2010. You talked about makers and takers in society and a culture of redistribution. But in February 2014, you wrote a very important article in commentary, be open-hearted, uh, open-handed toward your brothers. Uh, and you have said, we have to declare peace on the safety net, which I think is a really important thing to say. And so, um, you know, and as the president suggested, uh, so the safety net we have has actually cut poverty substantially. So a uh, twin questions, uh, could you talk about how and why your own views have changed, if I fairly characterize that? Uh, and in the spirit we're celebrating here of um, trans ideological nonpartisanship, now there's a mouthful for you. Yeah. Uh, in that spirit, um, where can Republicans cooperate with Democrats, conservatives, with liberals uh, on safety net issues like making the earned income tax credit permanent or expanding the child tax credit? I mean, where can we find not just verbal common ground, but actual common ground to get things done for the least among us. Well, thank you, EJ, and thank you, Mr. President. It's an honor to be here and with all of you. Uh, this is such an important exercise in bringing Catholics and evangelicals together, but having a public discussion. Uh, one of the main things that I do as president of AEI uh, is to talk publicly about issues and start a conversation with my colleagues in a way that I, I hope can can stimulate the conversation and spread it around the country. When at the American Enterprise Institute, where we have a, a long-standing history of work on the nature of American capitalism, when we're focusing very deeply on poverty, it sends a signal to a lot of people that are deeply involved in the free enterprise movement. My colleague Robert Doerr is here. He came to AEI because poverty is the most important thing to him. And indeed, the reason I came into the free enterprise movement many years ago is because poverty is the thing I care about the most. And in point of fact, two billion people around the world have been lifted up out of poverty because of ideas revolving around free enterprise and free trade and uh, the globalization of ideas of, of, of sharing through property rights and rule of law and all the things that the president is talking about in policy debates right now. That's why I'm in this particular movement, but we've gotten into a partisan moment where we substitute a moral consensus about how we serve the least of these, our brothers and sisters, uh, where we pretend that, that, that moral consensus is, is impossible and we blow up policy differences until they become a holy war. That's got to stop because it's completely unnecessary. Now, you, you brought... <laughs> and we can stop that absolutely with a couple of key principles. So how are we on the, on the center right talking about poverty in the most effective way? Number one is with a, a conceptual matter. We have a, a, a grave tendency on both the left and the right to talk about poor people as the other. Remember in Matthew 25, these are our brothers and sisters. Jim Wallace and I have this road show where we go to campuses and we, everybody wants to set us up in right-left debates and it never works out because it turns out we both have a commitment to the teachings of the Savior when it comes to treating the least of these our brothers and sisters. When you talk about people as your brothers and sisters, you don't talk about them as liabilities to manage. They're not liabilities to manage. They're assets to develop because every one of us made in God's image is an asset to develop. That's a completely different approach to poverty alleviation. That's a, a human capital approach to poverty alleviation. That's what we can do to, to stimulate that, that, uh, that conversation on, on, on the political right just as it can be on the political left. One concept that rides along with that is to point out, and this is what I do to many of my friends on, on Capitol Hill, I remind them that just because people are 
on public assistance doesn't mean they want to be on public assistance. And that's the difference between people who factually are making a living and who are accepting public assistance. That's a, it's an important matter to remember about the motivations of people and, and humanizing them. And, and then, then the question is, how can we come together? How can we come together? I have indeed written that it's time to declare peace on the safety net. And I say that as a, as a, as a political conservative. Why? Because Ronald Reagan said that. Because Friedrich Hayek said that. This is not a radical position. In fact, the, the social safety net is one of the greatest achievements of free enterprise, that we could have the wealth and largesse as a society, that we can take, help take care of people who are poor that we've never even met. It's ahistoric. It's never happened before. We should be proud of that. But then when I talk to conservative policymakers, I say, how should you distinguish yourself from the traditional positions in a, in a marketplace of ideas from progressives? You should also talk about the fact that, that the safety net should be limited to people who are truly indigent, as opposed to being spread around in a way that metastasizes into middle class entitlements and imperils our economy. And the third part is that that help should always come with the dignifying power of work to the extent that we can. Then we can have, with these three ideas, declaring peace on the safety net, safety net only for the indigent, and always with work, then we can have an interesting moral consensus and policy competition of ideas and maybe make some progress. Thank you. Um, in fact, I'd, I'm hoping people will challenge each other about what that actually means in terms of policy, and I want to invite the president to do that. I'm tempted, Mr. President, to ask you to sort of go in a couple of directions at once. Um, you know, one is I am, you know, again, hoping that you can enlist Arthur as your lobbyist on this. Um, one, a, one kind of question I want to ask is if John Boehner and Mitch McConnell were watching this and suddenly had a conversion, and there are a lot of religious people in the audience, I so miracles. They're not says, watching this. They, uh, well, <laughs> they, <laughs> Uh, they be, it's a hypothetical. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a religious audience. They believe in miracles. So <laughs> if they said we are uh, so persuaded that it's time we do something about the poor, Mr. President, uh, tell us a few things that we'll actually pass. We'll do this. Uh, when you think about, you know, we can talk kind of abstractly about, you know, the family on this side and what government can do. What do you think would actually make a difference? So that's one kind of question I'm tempted to ask, and maybe you could put that in the context of Bob's uh, mention of the Gilded Age, because, uh, you know, as you know, I'm, I was much taken by that Oswatomi speech. I even learned how to pronounce Oswatomi, thanks to you, uh, back in, uh, in uh, 20, um, uh, 20, uh, help me, uh, <laughs> I, I, the, anyway. A couple years ago. Yeah, a couple of years ago, uh, 2011. <laughs> Um, you know, and it really did put this conversation in context where we do seem in certain ways to be having the problems we had back then. So what would you tell Congress, please help me on this, and how do we sort of move out of this uh, Gilded Age feeling kind of period? Well, well l l let me tease out a couple of things that both Bob and Arthur said, and maybe some of these will be uh, challenging to a couple of them. They may, they, they may want to... Uh respond. Uh, but, but let me talk about big picture and then we can talk about specifics. Um, first of all, I think we can all stipulate that uh, the best anti-poverty program is a job, uh, which confers not just income, but structure and dignity uh, and a sense of connection to community, which means we have to spend time thinking about the macro economy, the broader economy as a whole. Now, what has happened is, is that since, let's say, 1973, uh, over the last 40 years. Uh, the share of income going to the bottom 90% has shrunk from about 65% down to about 53%. It's a big shift. It's a big transfer. And so we can't have a conversation about poverty without talking about what's happened to the middle class and the ladders of opportunity into, into the middle class. And when I uh, read Bob's book, uh, you know, the, the first thing that strikes you is when he's growing up in Ohio, he's in a community where the banker is living in reasonable proximity to the janitor at the school. The janitor's daughter may be going out with the banker's son. 
there are a set of common institutions. They may attend the same church. They may be a member of the same Rotary Club. They may be uh, you know, uh, active at the same parks uh, and uh, all the, the things that stitch them together. And that is all contributing to social mobility and uh, to uh, a sense of possibility and opportunity for all kids in that community. Exactly. Right? Now, part of what's happened is that, and, and this is where Arthur and I would probably have some disagreements, we don't dispute that the free market is the greatest uh, producer of wealth in history. It has lifted billions of people out of poverty. We believe in property rights, rule of law, so forth. Um, but there has always been trends in the market in which uh, concentrations of wealth can lead to some being left behind. And what's happened in our economy is that those who are doing better and better, more skilled, more educated, luckier, having greater advantages, are withdrawing from sort of the commons Kids start going to private schools. Kids start working out at private clubs instead of the public parks. An anti-government ideology then disinvests from those common goods and those things that draw us together. And that, in part, contributes to uh, the fact that there's less opportunity for our kids, all of our kids. Now, that's not inevitable. A free market is perfectly compatible with also us making investment in good public schools, public universities, investments in public parks, investments in uh, a whole bunch of public infrastructure that, that grows our economy and, and spreads it around. Uh, but that's in, in part what's been under attack for the last 30 years. And so in some ways, rather than soften the edges of the market, we've turbocharged it. And uh, we have not been willing, I think, to make some of those common investments so that everybody can play a part in getting opportunity. Now, I, one other thing I've got to say about this is that even back in Bob's day, that was also happening. It's just it was happening to black people. And, 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 and so in, in some ways, part of what's changed is that those uh, biases or those restrictions on who had access to resources that allowed them to climb out of poverty, um, who had access to the firefighter's job, who had access to the assembly line job, the blue collar job that paid well enough to be in the middle class and then got you to the suburbs uh, and then the next generation was suddenly office workers. Uh, all those things were foreclosed to a big chunk of the minority population in this country for decades. And that accumulated and built up. And over time, people with less and less resources, more and more strains, because it's hard being poor. People, people don't like being poor, and it's, it's time-consuming, it's stressful, it is, it's hard. And so over time, families frayed, men who could not get jobs left, mothers who are single are not able to read as much to their kids. So all that was happening 40 years ago to African Americans. And now what we're seeing is that those same trends have accelerated and they're spreading to the broader community. But the pattern that, Bob, you're recording in some of your stories is no different when, than what William Julius Wilson was talking about when he talked about the truly disadvantaged. So, so I, I, I say all this, and, and I know that was not an answer to your question. <laughs> I, will, I will be willing to answer, but I, but I think it is important for us at the outset to acknowledge if, in fact, we are going to find common ground, then we also have to acknowledge that there are certain investments we are willing to make as a society, as a whole, in public schools and public universities, in, today, I believe, early childhood education, in 
making sure that uh, that economic opportunity is available in communities that are isolated and that somebody can get a job and that there's actually a train that takes folks to where the jobs are. Uh, that broadband lines are in rural communities and not just in cities. And those things are not going to happen through market forces alone. And if that's the case, then our government and our budgets have to reflect our willingness to make those investments. If we don't make those investments, then you know, we could agree on the earned income tax credit, which I know Arthur believes in. We could agree on home visitation for low-income parents. Uh, all those things will make a difference, but the broader trends in our society will make it harder and harder for us to deal with both inequality and poverty. And, and so I, I think it's important for us to, to recognize there is a genuine debate here, and that is what portion of our collective wealth and budget are we willing to invest in those things that allow a poor kid, whether in a rural town or in Appalachia or in the inner city, to access what they need, both in, in terms of mentors and social networks, as well as decent books and computers and so forth, in order for them to succeed in, uh, along the terms that Arthur discussed. And right now, they don't have those things, and those things have been stripped away. You look at state budgets, you look at city budgets, and you look at federal budgets, and we don't make those same common investments that we used to, and it's had an impact. A and we shouldn't pretend that somehow uh, we have been making those same investments. We haven't been. Uh, and there's been a very specific ideological push not to make those investments. Which That's where I, the argument comes in. And if I could follow up, which gets to um, the underlying problem where we talk um, piously sometimes about let's tear down these ideological red-blue barriers, yet when push comes to shove, these things get rejected. How do you change uh, the politics of that? I mean, that you know, as you said, that uh, Mitch McConnell and John Boehner were unlikely to be watching us. That actually has a kind of political significance, not to this event, well, I, but I in general. I, 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 no, but I, I was I don't think they're that's busy a, right now. They, they've got votes. <laughs> and, <laughs> no, but I think you were saying uh, something else. You know, how do you tear down those barriers? Because you laid out a fairly robust agenda there. And I want to, forgive me, Arthur and Bob, but I'm curious, how do you get from here to there? Well. Part of what happened in our politics and part of what shifted from when Bob was young and he was seeing uh, a, a, a genuine community. There were, there were still class divisions in your small town. Uh, there were probably certain clubs or certain activities that were still restricted to the banker's son as opposed to the janitor's son. But it was more integrated. Part of what's happened is, is that elites in a very mobile, uh, globalized world are able to live together away from folks who are not as wealthy. Uh, and so they're, they feel less of a commitment uh, to making those investments. Uh, in, in that sense, sort of what used to be racial segregation now mirrors itself mm -hmm. in class segregation and, uh, and this great sorting that's taken place. Now that creates its own politics, right? I mean, there's some communities where I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't know, not only do I not know poor people, I don't even know people who have trouble paying the bills at the end of the month. I just don't know those people. And so there's a, a less sense of investment in those children. So that's part of what's happened. But part of it has also been, there's always been a strain in American politics where you've got the middle class and the question's been, who, who are you mad at if you're struggling? If you're working, but you don't seem to be getting ahead. And over the last 40 years, sadly, I think there's been uh, an effort to either make folks mad at folks at the top or to make mad, uh, be mad at folks at the bottom. Uh, and I think the effort to suggest that the poor are sponges, leeches, are 
don't want to work, are lazy, you know, uh, are undeserving, got traction. Uh, and, and look, it, it's still being propagated. I, I mean, I have to say that you know, if, if you watch Fox News on a regular basis, it is a constant menu. They will find like folks who make me mad. I don't know where they find them, right? They're all like, I don't want to work. I just want a free Obama phone or whatever. And, and that becomes an entire narrative, right, that, that gets worked up. Uh, and and you, very rarely do you hear an interview of a waitress, which is much more typical, who's raising a couple of kids and is doing everything right but still can't pay the bills. Um, and so if we're going to change how John Boehner and Mitch McConnell think. We're going to have to change how our body politic mm -hmm. thinks, which means we're going to have to change how the media reports on these issues and how people's impressions of what, it, what it's like to struggle in this economy looks like and how budgets connect to that. And, and that's a, it's a hard process because uh, that, that, that requires uh, a much broader conversation uh, than, than typically we have uh, on the nightly news. I'm tempted to um, welcome Arthur to defend his network, but instead, I want to sort of maybe invite him to an altar call here. <laughs> I want to invite you to a kind of altar call, which is the president talked about some basic public investments um, that are actually pretty old-fashioned public investments along the lines of somebody like President Eisenhower supported a lot of those kinds of investments. The most Republican president. What? Abraham Lincoln thought things like land-grant colleges and infrastructure, uh, investments in basic research and science were important. I suspect, uh, Arthur, you'd, you'd, you'd agree in, in theory about those investments, and then the question would be how much? How much? How much? Yeah. Sure. Right. Look, uh, no good economist, no self-respecting person who understands anything about economics denies that there are public goods. There just are public goods. We need public goods. Markets fail sometimes. There's a role for the state. There are no radical libertarians up here. There are uh, libertarians who believe that the state should not exist, for example. I mean, libertarians don't think that. <laughs> so it, let's, we shouldn't caricature the views of others because in point of fact, that, that's, that impugns the motives. I think that what we're talking about is, one, when are there public goods? When can the government provide them? And when are the benefits higher than the costs of the government providing these things? Because in point of fact, when we don't make cost-benefit calculations, at least at the macro level, about public goods, the poor pay. This is a fact. If you look at what's happening in the periphery countries of Europe today, this is a, as, you know, as George W. Bush used to say, this is a true fact. They, uh, uh, <clears throat> <laughs> it's, it's more emphasis. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> the, uh, if you don't pay attention to the macroeconomy and the fiscal stability, you will become insolvent. And if you become insolvent, you will have austerity. And if you have austerity, the poor always pay. Jim Wallace taught me this. The poor always pay when there's austerity. The rich never pay. The rich never are left with the bill. It's the poor who are left with the bill. So if you join me in believing the safety net is a fundamental moral right and it's a privilege of our society to provide, you must avoid austerity and you must avoid insolvency. And the only way that you can do that is with smart policies. And I, I, I'm 100% sure that the president agrees with me about smart macroeconomic public policies. So I'm not caricaturing these views either. Although, can you believe he said Obama phone? <laughs> <laughs> And he's against the Obama phone, so let's stipulate to that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just only because they took away his phone. <laughs> now, since we believe that there should be public goods, then we're really talking about the system that provides them and provides them efficiently. The president talked about the changing structure of the income distribution, and it's unambiguously true. What I would urge us to, um, to regret is this notion that it's not a shift but a transfer. Okay, now, I, it's not a transfer. Since the 1970s, it's not that the rich have gotten richer because the poor have gotten poorer. The poor are not having their money taken away and given to the rich. 
The rich have gotten richer faster than the poor have moved up, and we might be concerned with that because that also reflects on opportunity. And as an opportunity society, as an equal opportunity society, we should all be really concerned with that. But to the extent that we can get away from this notion that the rich are stealing from the poor, then we can look at this, and I think, in a way that's constructive. Why? Because the rich are our neighbors, and the poor are our neighbors, and everybody else should be our neighbors, and they're all our kids. And I think getting away from that rhetoric is really important. And then the last point is actually, as we come to consensus, is remembering that that capitalism or socialism or social democracy or any system is just a system. Look, it's just a system. It's not, it's just a machine. It's like your car. You can do great good with it. You can do great evil with it. It can't go uninhibited so far. It can't drive on its own. Will soon enough. The economy never will be able to. Capitalism is nothing more than a system, and it must be predicated on right morals. It must be. Adam Smith taught me that. Adam Smith, the father of modern economics, he wrote the, the Wealth of Nations in 1776. 17 years before, he wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which was a more important book because it talked about what it meant as a society to earn the right to have free enterprise, to have free economics. And it was true then, and it's still true today. So this is why this conference is so important. This conversation with the President of the United States is so important from my point of view, I say with appropriate humility, it's because we're talking about right morality toward our brothers and sisters, and built on that, that's when we can have an open discussion to get our capitalism right, and then the distribution of resources is only a tertiary question. <laughs> I, I still want to know how much infrastructure you're actually willing to vote for, but I'll take it. <laughs> I'll, I'll take Forty-one me, billion dollars. All right, <laughs> to start, we can negotiate. Um, <laughs> I want to, this is in a way for both the president and Bob, because in this conversation about poverty, there's a, there's a kind of consensus on this stage that yes, you need to care about family structure, it really matters, but if you don't worry about the economy, you're not sort of thinking about why the battering rams against the family. And yet, this family conversation can make a lot of people feel uneasy because it sounds like either you're not taking politics seriously or you're not taking the real economic pressures seriously. And I just want to share two things with the President and Bob and have you respond. One, as you can imagine, I asked a lot of smart people what they would ask about uh, if they were in my position. And one very smart economist said, look, uh, what we know is when we have really tight labor markets, unemployment down below, uh, you know, down to four or even lower, um, Kennedy Johnson years, World War II, uh, you know, at the end of the Clinton years, all kinds of good things start happening to poor people. So maybe this person said, uh, uh, even though he says, yes, family structure matters, let's stop with the moral lectures and just run a really tight economic policy, and we could have some really good things happen to us. And then the other thing I wanted to share, and I'm, I'm being pointed here, Mr. President, because you know, and you've, I've heard you talk about this, but uh, not that often, uh, publicly, which is, you know, I, I've heard you in those sessions you do with opinion reporters. Um, yeah, Ta-Nehisi Coates wrote something back in uh, 2013 about your talk about, um, uh, uh, about what needs to happen inside the African-American community. And I know you remember this, you know, taking full measure of the Obama presidency thus far, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that this White House has one way of addressing the social ills that afflict, afflict black people, and particularly black youth, and another way of addressing uh, everyone else. I would have a hard time imagining the president telling the women of Barnard that, that quotes, there's no longer room for any excuses, as though they were in the business of making them. I'd love you to address sort of the, the particular question about, you know, maybe it is primarily about economics because we can't do much about the other things through government policy, and also, answer ta critique, because I know you hear that a lot. Well, I want to, I'm going to try to respond to that, and, and, and of course I want to hear what the President has to say about that, but I wanted to just comment briefly on that earlier conversation about, first of all, about public goods. Um, uh, I agree very much with the President's framing of this issue, that is that we've disinvested in collective assets, collective goods that would benefit everybody but are more important for poor people because they can't do it on their own. I want to just give one example of that that's very vivid, and this is a case where we've clearly shot ourselves in the foot. 
for most of the 20th century, all Americans of all walks of life thought that part of getting a good education was getting soft skills, not just reading, writing, arithmetic, but cooperation and teamwork and so on. And part of that was that everybody in the country got free access to extracurricular activities, Sports, band and music. football and, and music and so on. But beginning about 20 years ago, the view developed, which is really, really deeply evil, that that's just a frill. And so, we disinvested and we said, if you want, to have, you want to take part in football here or you want to take part in music, you've got to pay for it. And, and of course, what that means is that poor people can't pay for it. It's a big deal. $1,600 on average for two kids in a, in a, in a family. Well, $1,600 to play football or you know, play in the band or French club or whatever. It's not a big deal if your income is $200,000, but if your income is $16,000, who in their right mind is going to be paying 10% of their family income? So it seems to me that that's a case where the allegation that the benefits of learning teamwork and, and, and hard skills and so, I mean, hard, hard uh, you know, grit, um, were only on the individual, but that wasn't true. The whole country was benefiting from the fact that we had a very broad-based set of skills that people had. So it's a, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize this, how deep runs this antipathy in some quarters for the notion that these are all our kids and therefore we got to invest in all of them. But I also want to then come back, if I can, to I think the thing we maybe haven't spent enough time here, and that is, this is a purple problem. There are those of us who, on the left, can see most clearly the economic sources of this problem and want to do something about it. But then there are people on the conservative side, especially religious people, who, can, who use a different lens and they can see most clearly the effects of family disruption among poor families of all races on the prospects of kids. And in the stories of the kids that we gathered across America, I want to return a little bit, not just to the abstract discussion of poverty, but to real kids. Mary Sue in Port Clinton doesn't have anything like the same opportunities as my, grand, as my granddaughter, but part of that is because Mary Sue's parents behaved in very irresponsible ways. We, intervie ways. we interviewed a, a kid from, uh, a, a young woman from Duluth who is now on drugs. How did she get on drugs? Because her dad want, was addicted to meth and wanted to get high, but didn't want to get high alone. So her dad taught Molly, is her name, to how to, you know, smoke, how to do meth. I don't even know how you do meth myself. I have to check with him. <laughs> so, and, and it's systematically, the fact is we, we all know this, that it's, I'm not making a, 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 an attack on, on single moms who are often doing terrific jobs in the face of lots of obstacles, but I am saying it's harder to do that, and therefore we need to think, all of us, including those of us, and I know the president agrees with me about this, even those, on, those of us on the more progressive side have to think, how did we get into a state in which two-thirds of American kids coming from what we used to call the working class have only a single parent, and what can we do to fix that? I'm not sure this is government's role, but I do think that if we're concerned about poverty, we also all of us have to think about this purple side of the problem, I mean, this, 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 this family side of the problem, and we, we shouldn't, those of us, are, I'm now speaking to, to my side of the, of the choir, we shouldn't just assume that anybody who talks about, about family stability is somehow uh, saying that the economics don't matter. Of course the economics matter. It's both and, it's not either or. Mr. President? Well... A couple of things I would say. First of all, just going back to something Arthur said earlier um, about how we characterize the wealthy and do they take this uh, extra wealth from uh, the poor, the middle class. I, these are broad economic trends uh, turbocharged by technology and globalization, uh, a winner-take-all economy that allows those with even slightly better skills to massively expand their reach and their markets and they make more money and it gets more concentrated and that then reinforces itself. Um, but there are values and decisions that have uh, aided and abetted that process. So, for example, uh, in the era that Bob was talking about, uh, if you had a company in that town, that company had a whole bunch of social restraints on it because the CEO felt it was a member of that community and the sense of obligation about paying a certain wage or 
contributing to the local high school or what have you was real. And today, the average Fortune 500 company, uh, some are great corporate citizens, some are great uh, employers, but they don't have to be, and that's certainly not how they're judged. And that may account for the fact that where uh, a, a previous CEO of a company might have made 50 times the average wage of the worker, they might now make 1,000 times or 2,000 times. And, and, and that's now accepted practice inside the corporate boardroom. Now, that's not because they're bad people. It's just that they have been freed from a certain set of social constraints. And those values have changed. Uh, and sometimes tax policy has encouraged that. And government policy has encouraged that. And there's a whole literature that justifies that as, well, that's what you need to get the best CEO, and they're bringing the most value. And then you do tip into a little bit of Ayn Rand, <laughs> which, Arthur, I think you'd be the first to acknowledge, because, you know, I'm, I'm in dinners with some of your buddies, you know, and I have <laughs> conversations with them. And if, if they're not on a panel, they'll say, you know what? We, we created all this stuff, and we made it, and we're creating value, and, and you know, we, we, we should be able to make decisions about where it goes. So there is less commitment to those public goods, even though a good economist who's read Adam Smith's uh, uh, moral sentiments uh, would acknowledge that actually we're underinvesting, or at least we have to have a certain investment. So that's point number one. Point number two on this whole family character, values, structure issue. Uh, it's true that if I'm, in, uh, if I'm giving a, uh, a commencement at Morehouse, that I will have a conversation with young black men about taking responsibility as fathers that I probably will not have with the women of Barnard. And I make no apologies for that. And the reason is, is because uh, I am a black man who grew up without a father. And I know the cost that I paid for that. And I also know that I had the capacity to break that cycle. And as a consequence, I think my daughters are better off. And that is not something that, that is, that is not something, for me to have that conversation does not negate my conversation about the need for early childhood education or the need for job training or the need for greater investment in, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure or, you know, jobs in low-income communities. So, I, look, I'll, I'll talk till you're blue, blue in the face about hard-nosed economic, macroeconomic policies. But in the meantime, I've got a bunch of kids right now who are graduating, and I want to give them some sense that they can have an impact on their immediate circumstances and the joys of fatherhood. And we did something with my brother's keepers, which emphasizes apprenticeships and emphasizes corporate responsibility. And we're gathering resources to give very concrete uh, hooks for kids to, to be able to advance. And I'm going very hard at issues of criminal justice reform and breaking this school to uh, prison pipeline that exists for so many young African-American men. But when I'm sitting there talking to these kids, and I've got a boy who says, you know what, H how did you get over being mad at your dad? Because I've got a father who beat my mom and now has left and has left the state, and I've never seen him because he's trying to avoid $83,000 in child support payments. And I want to love my dad, but I don't know how to do that. I'm not going to have a conversation with him about macroeconomics. <laughs> I, I'm going to have a conversation with him about, about how I tried to understand what it is that my father had gone through and how issues of, uh, th that were very specific to him created his difficulties in uh, his relationships and his children so that I might be able to forgive him and that I might then be able to come to terms with that. 
And I don't apologize for that conversation. I think, it, and, and so this is what, what I mean when, when or, 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 or this is where I agree very much with Bob, that this is not an either or conversation. It is a both and. The reason we get trapped in the either or conversation is because all too often, not, not Arthur, but those who have argued against a safety net or argued against government programs have used the rationale that character matters, family matters, uh, values matter as a rationale for the disinvestment in public goods that took place over the course of 20 to 30 years. If, in fact, the most important thing is character and parents, then it's okay if we don't have band and music at school. That's the argument that you will hear. It's okay, that, look, they're, they're immigrant kids who are learning in sc uh, schools that are, are much worse, and we're, we're spending huge amounts in the district and, and we still get poor outcomes, and so obviously money's not the issue. A and so what you hear is a logic that is used as an excuse to underinvest in those public goods. And that's why I think a lot of people are resistant to it and, and are skeptical of that conversation. And I guess what I'm saying is that guarding against cynicism, what we should say is we are going to argue hard for those public investments. We're going to argue hard for early childhood education because, by the way, if a young kid, three, four years old, is hearing a lot of words, the science tells us that they're going to be more likely to succeed at school. And if they've got trained and decently paid teachers in that, in that uh, preschool, then they're actually going to get, you know, by the time they're in the third grade, they'll be reading at grade level. And those are all very concrete policies, but it requires some money. We're going to argue hard for that stuff. And lo and behold, if we do those things, the values and the character that those kids are learning in a loving environment, where they can succeed in school and they're being praised and they can read at grade level and they're less likely to drop out. And, and it turns out that when they're succeeding at school and they've got resources, they're less likely to get pregnant as teens and less likely to engage in, in drugs and less likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. That is a reinforcement of the values and characters that we want. And that's where we as a society have the capacity to make a real difference. But it will cost us some money. It will, it will cost us some money. It, it's not free. And you, you look at a state like California that used to have by far the best public higher education system in the world, and there is a direct correlation between Proposition 13 and the slow disinvestment in the public university system so that it became very, very expensive. And kids got priced out of the market. Or they started taking on a whole bunch of debt. Now that was a public policy choice based on folks not wanting to pay property taxes. And that's true in cities and counties and states all across the country. And, and that's, a, that's really a big part of our political argument. So, I am all for values, I am all for character, but I also know that that character and that values, uh, the values that our kids have that allow them to succeed in delayed gratification and discipline and hard work, that all those things in part are shaped by what they see, what they see really early on. And, there, and some of those kids right now, because of no fault of those kids and because of history and, and you know, some tough going uh, generationally, some of those kids, they're not going to get help at home. They're not going to get enough help at home. And the question then becomes, are, are we committed to helping them instead? That's right. Mr. President, I want to follow up on that and then invite Arthur and Bob uh, to reply. Arthur, you clearly got a plenary indulgence in this uh, session on all kinds of, op of <laughs> positions. The, a lot of us, uh, I think, feel that we made bargains with our friends on the conservative side that I agree 
uh, with the idea that you've got to care about what happens in the family if you're going to care about social justice, and you've got to care about social justice if you care about the family. Yet, when people like you start talking like this, uh, there doesn't seem to be much give back on, okay, we agree on these values. Where's the investment in these kids? Similarly, when welfare reform was passed back in the 90s, uh, there were a lot of people said, okay, we're not going to hear about welfare cheats anymore because all these people are going to have to work. And yet, we get the same thing back again. It's as if the work requirement was never put in the welfare bill. How do we change this conversation so that it becomes an actual bargain where the other half of the agenda that you talked about gets recognized and that we do something about it? I, I, I'm, I'll ask Arthur for some advice on this because, <laughs> I, I, look, the, the devil's in the details. I think if, if you talk to uh, any of my Republican friends, they will say, number one, they care about the poor, and I believe them. Number two, they'll say that there are some public goods that have to be made, and I'll believe them. But when it comes to actually establishing budgets, making choices, prioritizing, that's when it starts breaking down. And, uh, you know, I actually think that uh, There will come a time when political pressure re leads to a shift because more and more families, not just inner city African American families or Hispanic families in the barrios, but more and more uh, middle class or working class folks are feeling pinched and squeezed that there will be a greater demand for some core public goods and we'll have to find a way to pay for them. Um, but, but ultimately, there are going to have to be some choices made. When, when I, for example, make an argument about closing the carried interest loophole that exists, whereby hedge fund managers are paying 15% on the fees and income that they collect. Yes, I've, I've been called Hitler for doing this, or at least this is like Hitler going into Poland. That's an actual quote from a hedge fund manager when I made that recommendation. Uh, the top 25 hedge fund managers made uh, more than all the kindergarten teachers in the country. So I'm not. When I say that, I'm not saying that because I dislike hedge fund managers or I think they're evil. Uh, I'm saying that you're paying a lower rate than a lot of folks who are making $300,000 a year. Uh, you've, you pretty much have more than you'll ever be able to use and your family will ever be able to use. There's a fairness issue involved here. And by the way, if we were able to close that loophole, I can now invest in early childhood education that will make a difference. That's where the rubber hits the road. Right? That's, Arthur, where the question of compassion and I'm my brother's keeper comes into play. And if we can't ask from society's lottery winners to just make that modest investment, then really this conversation is for show. If, if, if we can't ask that much. Right? So, and that's where, and, and, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not asking to, to go back to 70% marginal rates which existed back in the golden days that Bob's talking about when he was a kid. I'm, I'm just saying maybe we can go up to like, tax them like ordinary income which means that they might have to pay you know, a, 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 you know, a, a true rate of around 23, 25%, which by historical standards, post-war era, would still be really low. So that's, a, that's the kind of issue where 
if we can't bridge that gap, then I suspect we're not going to make as much progress as we need to, although we can find some areas of agreement like uh, the earned income uh, credit, which I give Arthur a lot of credit for uh, extolling because it encourages work and it could help uh, actually strengthen families. So, Arthur, raise capital gains taxes for us here. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, fine. These are show issues. Corporate jets are show issues. Carried interest is a show issue. The real issue, middle class entitlements. 70% of the federal budget. That's where the real money is. And you know, the truth of the matter is until we can take that on, if we want to make progress, if the left and right want to make progress politically as they put together budgets, they're going to have to make progress on that. Now, if we want to create, if we want to increase taxes on, on uh, carried interests, I mean, that's fine for me, not that I can speak for everybody, certainly not everybody <laughs> on the Republican side. And by the way, Mitch McConnell and John Boehner are watching, at least indirectly, and they're paying attention to this, 100% sure, because they care a lot about this. And they care a lot about both culture and economics, and they care a lot about poverty. And again, we have to be really careful not to impugn their motives. And impugning motives on the other side is the number one barrier against making progress. Ad hominem is something we should declare war on and defeat, because then we can take on issues on their face, I think. It's really important morally for us to be able to do that. Um, who, by the way, was who you having dinner with who was discussing Ayn Rand and why wasn't I invited? <laughs> <laughs> so if, if we want to make progress, let's, I think let's decide that we have a preference Let's, I mean, let's have, a, let's have a rumble over how much money we're spending on public goods for poor people, for sure. And Republicans should say, I want to spend money on programs for the poor, but I think these ones are counterproductive, and I think these ones are ineffective. And Democrats should say, no, they're not. We've never, we've never done them right, and they've always been underfunded. I want to have that competition of ideas. That's really productive. But we can't even get to that when politicians on the left and the right are conspiring to not touch middle class entitlements, because we're looking at it in terms of the right saying all the money's gone, on this, and the left saying all we need is a lot more money on top of these things, when, when most people who are looking at it realize that this is an unsustainable path. It's an unsustainable path for lots of things, not just programs for the poor. We can't adequately fund our military. I think you and I have, uh, would have a tremendous amount of agreement about the, the, the misguided notion of, of the sequester and for lots of reasons, because we can't spend money on purpose. And that's what we need to do when we're on an automatic path to spend tons of money in entitlements that are leading us to fiscal unsustainability. We can't get to these progressive conversations where conservatives and liberals really disagree and can work together potentially to help poor people and defend our nation. But I just want to say, if the carried interest is a show issue, why can't we just get it out of the way and move forward? You know, well, but that's well. It, 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 I, it, 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 it is real money. It's yeah. I mean, it, it's real money. Let me let me. Wait, here's what I like to do. I think we have about three minutes left, so I'd like Bob to speak, and then I have one last question for the president. Well, like, and I'm, probably all of us would agree about this. We need to a little bit rise out of the Washington bubble and the debates about these things. Of course, they're important. I understand why they're important, but actually. We're speaking here to an audience of people of faith. We're speaking largely, more largely to America. And I think we ought not to disempower ordinary Americans. If they care about these problems, Americans can change the politics that would, over, over the next five to ten years, make a huge difference. And I'm not talking about changing Republican Democrat. I'm talking about making poverty and the opportunity to escape from poverty a higher issue on both parties' agendas. I, I have some hope that that will happen. I, I understand, this may not be true, Mr. President, I understand that there's going to be an election uh, next year. And, that's uh, a true fact. That's a true fact. <laughs> <laughs> and I think American voters should insist that the highest domestic priority issue is this issue of the opportunity gap, the fact that we're talking about. This is not a third order issue, it's a really important issue, and ask candidates, what are you gonna do about it? And then just use your own common sense. Is that the right way to go forward? I think that we need, as a country, not just from the top down and from Washington, but from across the grassroots to focus, and in congregations and parishes all across this country, focus on what we can do to reduce this opportunity gap in America. 
Mr. President, I, I wanted you to reflect on this um, religious question. I mean, you're, uh, one of your first salaries was actually paid for by a group of Catholic churches, something Cardinal McCarrick knows that, but not a lot of Catholic bishops notice that, um, <laughs> that um, you um, were organizing for a group of Southside churches. You know what faith-based groups can do. And I'd like you to talk about sort of three things at the same time, which is the role of religious, the religious community simply in calling attention to this problem, the issues of how government can cooperate uh, uh, with these uh, groups, um, and sort of the prophetic role of these ideas for you, where your own reflections on, uh, on your own faith have led you on these questions. Well, uh, first of all, uh, it, it's true, my first job was funded through the Campaign for Human Development, which was the social justice arm of the Catholic Church. And um, I think that uh, faith-based groups across the country and around the world uh, understand the centrality and the importance of this issue. Uh, in a intimate way, uh, in part because these faith-based organizations are interacting with folks who are struggling and know how good these people are and know their stories. And, uh, and it, it's not just theological, but it's very concrete. They're embedded in communities and they're making a difference in all kinds of ways. Um, so, so, so I think that what our administration has done is, is really uh, a continuation of work that had been done previously by the Bush administration, the Clinton administration. We've got a, our Office of Faith-Based uh, uh, you know, Organizations that are, are working on an ongoing basis around a whole host of these issues. My Brother's Keepers reaching out to uh, churches and synagogues and, and mosques and, and other faith-based groups consistently to try to figure out how do we reach uh, young boys and young men uh, in a serious way. Um, but, I, but, but the one thing I guess I want to say, EJ, is that uh, when I think about my own Christian faith uh, and, and my obligations, uh, it is important for me to do what I can myself, individually, mentoring young people or making charitable donations or uh, you know, uh, in, in some ways impacting whatever circles and influence I have. But I also think it's important to, to have a voice in the larger debate. And uh, I think it would be powerful for our faith-based organizations to speak out on this in a more forceful fashion. Um, th this may sound self-interested because there have been, th these are areas where I agree with the evangelical community and faith-based groups and then there are issues where we uh, have had disagreements around uh, reproductive issues or uh, uh, same-sex marriage or what have you, and so uh, it, maybe it, it appears advantageous for me to want to focus on these issues of poverty and not as much on these other issues. Uh, but but I, I, I want to insist, first of all, I, don't ha I will not be part of the election next year. So, so, so this is more just a, a, a broader reflection as somebody who's worked with churches and worked in communities. Um, there is great caring and great concern but when it comes to what are you really going to the mat for? Like what, what's the defining issue? When you're talking to your, in, in, in your congregations, what, what's the thing that is really gonna capture the essence of who we are as Christians or as Catholics or what have you? That this is oftentimes viewed as a nice to have relative to an issue like abortion. That's not across the board, but there sometimes has been that view, in, and, and, and certainly that's how it's perceived in our political circles. And I think that 
it, there's more power to be had there, a more transformative voice that's available around these issues um, uh, that, that can move and touch people. Because the one thing I know is that he, he, here, here's an, an, an area where, again, Arthur and I agree. Um, I think fundamentally people want to do the right thing. I think people don't set out wanting to be selfish. I, I, I think people would like to see a society in which everybody has opportunity. I think that's true up and down the line across the board. And, but, but they feel as if it's not possible. And, and there's noise out there, and there's arguments, and there's contention. And so people withdraw, and they restrict themselves to what can I do in my church or what can I do in my community, and that's important. But uh, our, our faith-based groups, I, I think, have the capacity to frame this, and, and nobody's shown that better than uh, uh, Pope Francis, who I think has been transformative just through the, sin the sincerity and insistence that he's had that this is vital to who we are. This is vital to uh, following uh, what Jesus Christ, our Savior, talked about. And, um, and that emphasis, I think, is, is why he's had such incredible appeal, including to young people all around the world, and I hope that that uh, is a message that, uh, uh, that, that everybody receives when he comes to visit here. I can't, I can't wait to, to host him because I think it will help to spark an even broader conversation of the sort that we're having today. All events are better with a reference to Pope Francis. Thank you right. so much, right. uh, Mr. President. <laughs> I, I really want to thank Arthur and Bob, and thank you, Bob, for writing this book that's moved us all, and thank you, Mr. President, for being here, and John for, and uh, Galen and so many others for creating this. If I may close by simultaneously quoting Amos and Dr. King, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Bless you all. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you.